brother. You're welcome. Well, amen. What a joy to be here with you this morning. Do not take for granted this wonderful time of worship. I have the privilege of being in one of 69 uh, churches up in the Northwest Baptist Association on any given Sunday morning, and some of them would die to have this kind of music and uh, this type of blessing on a Sunday morning. I go to little churches that uh, uh, you know they're desperate because they've asked me to lead music before. Uh, they've asked Trudy to play the piano. <laughs> and uh, we both, at, in both cases, have graciously just said, no thank you, uh, the Lord has not gifted us in that way. I am somewhat musically inclined. I know how to play a radio. And uh, that is if the presets are all done for me already. Uh, beyond that, uh, there's not much for me to do, but you need to really take the opportunity to thank this choir, to thank this uh, brother that leads us, and, uh, and to participate in that time of worship. Um, I am here this morning. Uh, I'm going to kick off uh, this month that you're going to be talking about missions. Let's go ahead and get something out of the way. I want you to turn to the neighbor that you're sitting close to and say, this message on missions is not for me. I thought I would go ahead and get that out of the way because that's what you're thinking. You, you've already concluded at the beginning uh, that this is bound to be for somebody else. This is bound to be for, you know, uh, lifetime missionaries. This is bound to be for preachers. This is bound to be for directors of missions. So let's go ahead and just finish up that little discourse with one another. I want you to turn to the person next to you and say, Not! <laughs> this message is for you this morning. Uh, and it is for each and every one of us here because we are all, every one of us, in some capacity, if we have tasted of the Lord and found that He is good, we indeed are on mission for Him in some capacity, in some place, at school, at work, in our homes. You may be here today the only believer in your home and God has given you that house to be uh, a mission field. Now, this morning, I understand our youth are uh, getting ready to go on a mission trip soon, and so uh, they're working on a fundraiser, and Trudy and I want to be part of that fundraising effort, and uh, the last time that I was with you, uh, I shared with you that I had just written a brand new devotional, and the Lord has been at work in my life, uh, it's been a year and a half since I've been here, I guess, something like that. And uh, I've been able to, to write a brand new devotional. Some of you have already mentioned this morning that you've been reading Glasses in the Grass. Well, this is my newest devotional that's just been released back in October. It's Life is not a snapshot. It's a mosaic. Now, you think about uh, life, and if you could just have one picture that was, going to, that was going to frame the rest of your life, it would not be the picture of a funeral. It would not be a picture of sickness or an accident. It would be some happy occasion. But you see, life is not just happy occasions. It's all sorts of stuff that goes on in our life. The cover of the book has one picture in the middle. That picture I shot on a mission trip off the northwest coast of the Dominican Republic. Then I took all of the mission trips that I've been on for 15 years with Northwest Association... I asked a computer program to build a mosaic using that picture as the, the framework. And it took that 15 years of mission trip photos and built a mosaic out of that picture. That rectangle at the bottom, young people, has 10,878 photographs in it. Just the rectangle at the bottom. 10,878 photographs. China, Brazil... Haiti, Dominican Republic, Malaysia, go on down the list, Kenya, well, all of those places that the Lord's allowed me to go and to lead mission teams, that's what my life really is. I finally figured it out, what I'm going to say when I get to heaven. It's taken me 60 years to figure it out. I always wondered, what am I going to say when I step through those gates and I'm on those golden streets, 
and I see the glories of heaven, I finally figured it out. This is going to be the first thing that's going to come out of my mouth. Oh, now I understand. Because you see, as we live those individual moments in our lives, we think that's what's going to frame the rest of our life. But truthfully, it's just a snapshot. It's just part of the mosaic that God's building out of your life and my life each and every day. And that's how I wrote this book. Life is not a snapshot. It's a mosaic. And it's just stories and it's scripture uh, connections of how God fashions and forms our life. And Miss Trudy and I will be out in the foyer uh, at the end of the service and you can get a copy of that. Now hang on youth, this is going to be involving you too, so stay with me on this. Then I've written a Bible study, God's Leading. Not what is God's will, but God's leading. This book will give you seven ways to know that God's leading you right now. Today, in this moment, right here where you are now. Lots of folks want to know God's will for tomorrow, but I want to ask you, do you know if God's leading you right now today? Because truthfully, tomorrow may not come. So quit worrying about God's will for tomorrow and start wondering and asking the question, is God leading me right now here today? This little book's based out of Exodus 14, 13, 14, and 15, and it's written as a Bible study. And uh, both of those are going to be available for you. Now, this is what I'm going to do for you, youth, because I didn't know all this was going on until we communicated during the week about me bringing the books and all, and then I found out you were doing a fundraiser today. So, for the, all the rest of the congregation, everybody that buys the books today, I'm going to give 25% of everything total, and that gets it back to about to where uh, that's what the books cost. Uh, I'm going to give 25% of everything. I'm going to write a check to the youth department. And you can use that for your mission trip. Amen? Amen. amen. Now, everybody, the amen, then is going to buy a book. This is great, youth. <laughs> Tell them thank you. Thank you. Oh, the youth have already thanked you. Isn't this just wonderful that you are so gracious? Now, you probably have birthdays and all kinds of things coming up for folks. Here's a great opportunity. Get a book, give to the youth at the same time, and guess what? Before you leave church today, you will be on mission. You'll be on mission. I have enjoyed being the uh, associational missionary up in northwest Arkansas. I've been here 15 years now. They didn't st think I would stay that long, and neither did I. But the Lord has planted me here in northwest Arkansas. When I came to northwest Arkansas 15 years ago, it was still somewhat of a quiet place. <clears throat> when I came to interview for the position of being the associational missionary, I landed at uh, XNA. And uh, just a few planes had come in. The airport had just been open just weeks. And, and I knew I was coming to somewhat of a small place because when the plane landed, the cows ran back from the fence that ran along beside the runway. And I said, Wow. This is going to be interesting. Now you land at XNA and the cows never look up. You know, they just, there's been generations of calves that have been born with, with planes landing in the middle of their pasture. And uh, so it's been an interesting uh, time because in 1999, you could still pick apples a lot of places. Uh, where the mall is uh, up in Rogers was all grapevines still. Uh, you know, it was a quiet place still. Uh, for the most part, it was beginning to, to bust at the seams, but still no one thought that we would see what we're seeing around us now. And then, early part of, the, of this century, uh, Master Walmart uh, said, if you're going to sell to us, you're going to have a representative here in our area. And boy, all the vendors came to northwest Arkansas, and they brought their entourage with them. Uh, when I came to Northwest Association, our mission statement was very simple. Reaching the world from Northwest Arkansas. And I thought that was a real good mission statement. It, it basically said what we were and you could memorize it easily and, and remember it. But then all of a sudden, the world came to Northwest Arkansas. They just showed up on our doorstep. 
Here they were. The Hmong people were here, and, and the Chinese were here, and the Vietnamese were here, and the Malaysians were here, and, 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 and the Hispanics were here of all varieties. I remember going in, in, in a meeting in an upper room up in Rogers once to meet with a group, and in that group there were 27 countries represented in one room. I said, wow. This is incredible. So we had, to, we had to modify our mission statement. We added two words, and in. And now our mission statement says, reaching the world from and in northwest Arkansas. Because you can go on a mission trip, fly around the world, and be tired when you get there and very tired when you come home. But if you're not going across the street, you're really not doing missions. If you're not reaching your family, if you're not reaching your Sunday school class for Jesus, you're not really on mission. And it's even more evident that we need churches that are excited and vibrant about the work of missions because, you know, it's a very dark world. My old pastor, whom I still love, still living, uh, as I speak to him every now and again, I'm reminded of things he used to say. And he used to walk up to me as a very young preacher boy. He'd put his arm around me. Some bad news had just come out. And he would put his arm around me and say, It's getting gloriously darker, son. It's getting gloriously darker. You see, the truth of it is, the darker it is, the brighter your light's going to be able to shine. It only takes a small light to break the darkness. It's incredible when Jesus came into the world, the scripture tells us that Jesus came into the world and, and when this light called Jesus came into the world, the darkness comprehended it not. That word comprehend there means that, that, that it could not arrest it. It could not put its hands around it. It could not capture it. You see, when we leave this building today, no one's going to turn on the dark. They're going to turn out the lights. But nobody says, make sure you turn on the dark. We never have to turn the dark on. We only have to turn the light off. And any time a believer or a church turns the light off in the community where God has placed them, then the darkness takes its place. But the tiniest light, the smallest light, shining in the dark can make a difference. You see, we are to be a light into the darkness. Jesus said of us, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor did they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. You are the light of the world. Jesus said He was the light. The apostles tell us that God is light and in Him is no shadow of turning. Now it's great. We, we don't mind admitting that God is light and the fact that Jesus is light, we can get along with that. Oh, but to imagine that I'm a light. I am the light of the world. This might have been what Jesus was thinking when He said, You're going to do greater things than I've ever done. Jesus could only light the world in one place while he was in the flesh. Each place where he resided, he lit up that place. But now with believers scattered all around the world, maybe a billion of us, the lights are shining all around the world. You are the light of the world. You see, in this world that we're living in, we have to continue to let our lights shine. It has to be something that never ends. We don't light a candle and, and then that's it. We have to keep trimming the wick. We have to keep replacing the candle. Because indeed, you can impact your world by joining a volunteer mission team. Now that may be a team that's going to go to the other side of the world. That may be a team that's going to go to... Where are y'all going? Arlington, Texas. Mission Arlington. I think Six Flags is there too, right? Amen. That doesn't have anything to... No, I'm just kidding. Okay. Um, 
Hey, you ought to go where Six Flags is. Amen? I think that's a great thing to be able to do. You can go to Arlington, Texas, or you can go down where I drove through trying to get back home last week after we were in Louisiana, and lo and behold, in South Louisiana, got caught in an ice storm, of all things, and had to wind our way back home and wound up coming back home through Helena, Arkansas. Excuse me, Helena, West Helena. Wow, different world than Northwest Arkansas. You can be a part of impacting your world by joining a volunteer mission team. In Acts 16, 9, and 10, the Apostle Paul was seeking to go east. He wanted to go east towards Asia, towards ultimately what would be China and India and all of these countries. And God arrested him by a dream And there was a man in that dream, a a vision that came to him. And the man was from Macedonia, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. And a man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over unto Macedonia and help us. Now after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel unto them. Now we just read over this, gloss over this, and and just imagine, well, that was great for Paul, but what's that mean to us? Friends, if, if the Apostle Paul had not obeyed the word of the Lord, the command of God to go to Macedonia, you and I wouldn't be sitting in Elmdale Baptist Church this morning because God sent... Uh, sent Paul instead of east, he sent him north and west, and he went into Macedonia, and from there on into Europe. And then the day came when the Europeans came to this country, and here you are today because the Apostle Paul obeyed God in Acts 16, 9. And Macedonia received the gospel for the very first time. Now, when we think about Macedonia, this is what we think of. We think of some area stuck over there somewhere in a, in a faraway place. I've walked through Macedonia. It's now called Bosnia, Serbia. All of this used to be the old Yugoslavia. And now it's all broken up into those five states. I spent over five years distributing door to door to door to door New Testaments to Muslim families that live all up and down this corridor now in Macedonia. I knew that I was supposed to be there one day when I knocked on a door and a lady came to the door and she said, I've been praying for you to come for five years. She said this through an interpreter. Immediately I'm thinking, she doesn't know me. Why has she been praying for me? Where I stood, it was three steps up into her house. And she stood there and she said, I've been praying for you to come for five years. She said, five years ago, the Serbians came into my home. They took my husband and my three sons. And they stood them at the door where you're standing on the ground. And they shot them all dead. It does something to you when you realize you're staying in the blood of someone else. Then she said, they came into my home and they took all of my books, all of my literature, and they burned it. And they burned my Bible. And I've been waiting five years for someone to come and to bring me this book. And she held a little vinyl-covered copy of Savetto Pismo, the New Testament in the Croat language, in the, in the Bosnian language. And she held it to her breast And she hugged that New Testament. That'll make you realize that there's an importance to go to Macedonia. But your Macedonia may not be near as far as 12 hours away. It may just be 12 minutes away. It may be where you're going to go and eat today after this Service. It, it may be back into the home where God has you now as the only light in a darkened home. You may be a, a, a wife here today whose husband is lost and he sent you to church and you're here with your children and you feel all alone. You can go back and be a light in that home. You may be a child here today, a young person here today whose parents don't want anything to do with the Lord and God has placed you as a light in the home 
where you reside. You may go to a job tomorrow, sir, and, and you may be the only man on the job that doesn't cuss and tell stories and, and, and tell dirty jokes, and, and, and you find yourself all the time alone, and sometimes you wonder, God, why do you have me on this job with this crew working these hours? And God says, you are to be the light in the darkness where you are working. Your Macedonia can be a lot closer than you ever imagined. I'm going to take the word Macedonia, and over these next few minutes, it's going to become an acrostic. Every letter of the word Macedonia will help you to understand why you should be involved in missions. You see, missions begins with a mindset. You have to decide right here that you're going to go on missions. That's why I played the little game with you to begin with. Had you turn and say to everyone, this message is not for me, because you really don't believe it's for you. You believe it's for somebody else. You've given all the excuses to God. You're too old. You're too young. You're too poor. You've given all of those reasons why you can't be involved in missions. As if God didn't know what He was doing when He called you into the kingdom for such an hour as this. You have to develop a mindset for missions. You have to develop a mission vision. You have to begin to ask God, where do you want me to go? The Apostle Paul had his mind made up that he was going to go east, go to Asia. But God interceded and he sent a man in a dream with a vision. And Paul said, we decided this was a word from the Lord and we decided to go immediately. You need a vision. Not your vision, God's vision. And let it begin to burn in you. You need to develop a mission vision. You need to develop a mission focus. This church needs to decide who they're going to reach in their world. Who is it that lives on your street? Why did God put you in your neighborhood? Why? And you need to begin to have a focus. We don't need to have a shotgun approach here. We need to have a rifle approach. We need to have a laser approach where we focus on one people group, on one nation, on one street, on one job, on one home, on one person. A mission focus. We need to decide where that place is. We need to decide if it's going to be local, and it may be local. That may be just exactly what God wants you to do. It may be in this state. It may be that you need to go down to the Mississippi River Valley and you need to work in the southern and, and in the eastern part of this state where poverty is rampant. Perhaps it is that you need to go nationally. You need to go to Arlington. <coughs> you need to go to the Dakotas. You need to be on an Indian reservation. You need to be in one of the mega cities of this of this United States, that this morning, less than 1% of the population is in any given church. It may be that you need to go internationally. You need to decide the time. You need to decide that you're going to do it now. The Apostle Paul said in Acts, and we decided to go immediately. And we see this again and again and again throughout the Scriptures. When God gives a command, people rose up immediately to do it. When God said to Abraham, I want you to go and offer up your son on this mountain, he rose up early the next morning to go. This is not something you can put off. There's not enough time anymore for you to delay. We are to redeem the time. You need to decide the type of mission. You need to decide what talent that God has already given you, what gifts God has already given you, so that you can d decide the type of work that you're going to do. Miss Trudy and I, over the last two years, have been involved in teaching ESL in the Dominican Republic. It's incredible that we have a, a total all together of four and a half hours with a group of young people. Four and a half hours scattered over three days. 
And on the third day, on that Wednesday night, they come to the local church. And after four and a half hours of ESL, we're able to take a group of young people who can't speak any English and stand them before their church and they can say three Bible verses in English and they can sing two gospel songs all in English. And we do that in four and a half hours. Medical missions. There, there's all kinds of, of missions. But you can begin by prayer walking. I never realized the importance of prayer walking till I started delivering uh, New Testaments to Muslims in Bosnia. We had to go and spend some trips doing nothing but walking through those villages and breaking down barriers. Some of you need to prayer walk the perimeter of your school. Some of you need to prayer walk the perimeter of your neighborhood. Some of you need to prayer walk around your job. You need to decide that you're going to walk like the children of Israel did around the walls that surrounded Jericho and walk until God says, sound the trumpet and then watch what I'm going to do. And all of a sudden the walls start coming down. Scripture distribution, I've talked enough about that already. Medical teams. Construction teams, reconstruction teams. All of these are just a tip of the iceberg of possibilities of what you can do when you begin to develop a mindset towards missions. You can go to going.imb.org and there's all kinds of opportunities listed there that you can participate in. You can go to the nam.net, mobilize-me1, and there you'll find all kinds of opportunities for uh, uh, national missions. You can go to the Arkansas Baptist State Convention website, and you can find all sorts of in-state mission opportunities. Ignorance is no excuse anymore. The world is at your fingertips. A is action. M is mindset. A is action. You need to begin to build a team. Who said you had to do this alone? You don't need to do any of this alone. Begin to build a team. Talk it up. Find some other folks that God is speaking to this morning and get a team together. Join in with some other teams and get ready to go. You see, you may be the first team that ever goes where God is telling you to go. The Apostle Paul and his team were the first people to ever take the gospel to Macedonia. And God may make you the first team. Teams, from around, uh, teams form around exciting reports. I'm here this morning to excite you. That's what I want to do. I don't want you going to sleep on me. I don't want you writing this off. I don't want your little spiritual parasols up. Deciding that you're going to let the drippings of blessing fall on somebody else. I want it to be for you this morning. Teams form around exciting reports. Teams are multifaceted. We need traveling volunteers. We need some people who are willing to go. And some of you can go. See, I'm too old to go. The, I had one gentleman that went with me three times to Bosnia with a backpack on his back with 40 New Testaments in his back climbing 15 stairs up to the top of apartment buildings to begin to distribute. He was 80 years old. Blew us away. Put us young guys in the ground with his ability to, to distribute God's Word. We need traveling volunteers. We need praying volunteers. We need some of you that are going to begin this morning to say, you know what, I'm going to pray until God does something at Elmdale for missions. We need adopting volunteers. Some of you can't go, but you've got enough money that you can pay for one of these young people to go. You can pay for some other. Don't look at me like you don't have any money. You know you got it. It's in a CD or something. Cash it out. Let me give you some good news about your CD. They're not going to put a copy of it in your casket. I just want you to quit worrying about that. They're not going to do it. And you go down to the local funeral home here, and you ask the funeral director to let you look at all of the hearses. 
to be a great field trip. Just go and look at all the hearses. I can tell you one thing you will not find on a single hearse. There are no bumper hitches. Turn to the person next to you and say, that's funny. Because I don't think y'all are getting it. Y'all word to death that I'm here to take your money. I'm not here to take your money. It all belongs to God already. It's not your money. It's God's money already. 15 seconds of an F4 tornado this spring will prove it. Hello. <laughs> Y'all love it when I come, don't you? <laughs> I'm just a truth teller. You need to adopt somebody. You need to say, you know what? I'm too old. I'm too feeble. I'm too crippled. I got a l- 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 lisp. That was Moses' excuse. God took care of that. He just let him adopt Aaron. What is it that you're giving an excuse? Adopt somebody and send them in your place. Financial volunteers. I ain't going there no more. I haven't been there this morning. M is mindset. A is action. C is challenge. Missions are a challenge. You need to challenge yourself to leave your comfort zone. You need to decide that you're going to do something that's uncomfortable. Most of us are just bored to death with Jesus. Let that settle in on you just a minute. Challenge yourself to leave your comfort zone. The first mission trip I ever went to, I went to Nigeria. I didn't know nothing. I know that's a double negative, but it works in Watson. I didn't know nothing. I got on a plane. They dropped me off in Lagos, Nigeria. They put me on a bus and drove me 12 hours to a weary. A bunch of national pastors come and picked us up. There was 15 of us on this mission trip. And, and there were 15 white guys. And they brought us out into the bush. I, I, I figured out what it meant to be a minority. I was the only white guy anywhere to be seen. I spent 18 days. I lost 31 pounds. You want to lose weight? Go on a mission trip. When I came back, I said, I will never do this again. (laughs) I'm just telling you the truth. I said, I'll never, ever do this again. As of today, I've been on 50 or 60 mission trips. I've I've lost count. I don't know how many. Because the Lord wouldn't leave me alone. There's no joy in my comfort zone. Challenge others to join you in the adventure. We, we, We just tend to love it when somebody else does it with us. Gives you somebody to blame. Ask God for a mission that's bigger than your ability to perform. Wow. You want to be blessed, you ask God to do something in your life that's bigger than you can explain. Bigger than you can pay for. Bigger than you have the strength to accomplish. And He gets the glory. And finally, open your eyes to see a mission trip as an integral part of expanding the ministry of this church, your association at home and abroad. There's the challenge. M is mindset. A is action. C is challenge. We're working this long distance here. E, engage. Enter a time of spiritual preparation. We're not asking you to leave tomorrow morning. You need to begin now to enter a time of spiritual preparation. You remember the story. The preacher got up, said, How many of y'all want to go to heaven? Everybody everybody raised their hand. Except one little boy. Preacher tried it again. How many of y'all want to go to heaven? Everybody raised their hand. Not one little boy up front. Son, you don't want to go to heaven? He said, yes, sir, I want to go, but I thought you was getting up a load now. (laughs) I'm not here to get up a load, amen? 
You need to give this time. You need to begin now a time of spiritual preparation, asking God to prepare you for this. Engage a time. You can get a 30-day uh, uh, from the state partnership office here in Arkansas. You can get a 30-day guide that will walk you through a, a preparation of getting ready for missions. Begin now to learn all you can about the culture into which you need to be immersed. What do you young people know about Arlington? Okay, what else do you know about Arlington? Have any one of you gone out to a website and found out how many different language groups live in Arlington? Have you gone to see how many people live in Arlington? Do you know the opening and closing times of Six Flags? <laughs> Ten to six. <laughs> you have proved my point. I love young people. You know I love you. Amen? I, I'm making a mess out of your trip, but I love you. You need to learn about the people you're going to go and minister in. When you get there, know how many churches there are in Arlington. Know how many faiths there are. Know how many people live there. You need to be able to know all you can know about Arlington so when you go, you can speak Arlingtonese. Amen? They talk different there than they do in northwest Arkansas. Amen? Be, get, get, get all you can. Encourage prayer by listing prayer partners and engaging in local prayer walking. You can learn how to prayer walk doing it right here. And finally, begin journaling now and several weeks following the mission trip. You're going to want to tell your story. You're going to want to tell the story how God sent you the vision of a man from Macedonia. See, we wouldn't know that if Paul hadn't written it down. E is engage. D, develop. Develop your personal testimony. Some of you, if I put a gun to your head this morning, would have a difficult time giving me your personal testimony. You need to develop your personal testimony. You need to be able to do it where you can tell what God has done for you, where He found you, how He got you into a believing situation, and what He's done for you since. And you need to do it in three minutes. Nobody wants to see your slides. They want to hear your story. Three minutes. You need to develop your own personal testimony. And you need to make sure... That it's un-Americanized and de-churched. I just added de-churched to this. I used to say un-Americanized. But the truth of it is, most of the people you talk to today, right here in northwest Arkansas, don't understand what you mean when you say you got saved. They don't understand that. They don't understand what the term born again means. They don't understand what baptism is. You need to learn how to give your testimony in the vernacular. You need to learn how to talk to people where they are. And that's tough for us that's been in church for a while. We've learned the language. And so people come into our presence, they come into our churches, and they scratch their head because they don't know what's going on. Develop a network of support as a team Leader, begin regular communication with missionary personnel you'll work with on the field if you're going to take an international trip. Each person on the team needs uh, some and or as much of the following as possible. You need prayer support. If you're going to take a mission trip, get you a prayer team. You're going to need financial support. You're going to need to start raising some money. You need to develop a habit of regularly reporting both pre- and post mission trip. Start talking about it. Tell your Sunday school class about it. Tell your pastor about it. Tell the staff about it. Tell the church about it. Develop. Oh, we're going to get there. Organize. Short-term missions uh, means short-term missions means short-term planning. Not always. You need to develop a time to accomplish the task of organizing your mission trip. 
Here's how you do it. Begin with your departure date and work backwards, preferably one year. Now, in just a moment, I'm going to tell you how to take a mission trip every other year for the rest of your life, and it'll be paid for. Interested? Stay with me. Stay awake. We're almost there. Determine the total cost. No man setting out on a project doesn't first set down and consider the cost. You need to know what the cost is going to be. Need to have an initial team meeting. Get your team together. Even those that are just just interested. Require non-refundable deposits. We ought to get people hooked into this. You need to get your passport now. Passport's good for 10 years. You need to get it now. Some of you are going to find out within 30 days of me doing this presentation that there's a mission opportunity that's leaving in two months and you're not going to be able to go because you don't have your passport. You need to get your passport now. Y'all got your passport to go to Texas? Amen. Amen. You need it to get in to Six Flags. They will be checking your passport. <laughs> team orientation you need to let folks know what's going on set a time uh, and a date for final payment and then you hold a commissioning service staff of this church don't ever let anyone go on a mission trip that's not been commissioned by this church this youth group ought to be up here with hands laid on them before they leave you may do that already and that's fine but don't let anybody go on a mission trip that's not been commissioned by this church. That way this youth group goes, they're not knows that they're going in the name of this church and they're going in the name of Jesus Christ. Three more. Everybody that's glad that I didn't decide to do an acrostic on supercalifragilistic expialidocious, say amen. In. <laughs> oh. Necessities. Passport for the missionary for the international trip. Ooh, that's blue. I can't read it. Oh, that's where you go to state.gov and you can get it. There, turn white. Visas may be required. Create a packing checklist. Consider all the cost. You've got the cost of transportation. You got the cost of lodging. You got the cost of your passport and departure taxes. These are all just things that you're going to need. Immunizations if you're going to go overseas. Ground transportation while you're there. Food. Y'all got food figured out? Amen. Any sightseeing fees and project fees. And, of course, your insurance. Because once you leave U.S. soil, your insurance is no good. Guess what? Your insurance is no good here anymore. <laughs> I just thought I'd throw that in there, brother. Amen. <laughs> That's really funny. Okay. <laughs> I haven't done this presentation since October. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's going to take an investment. It's going to take an investment on your part. You realize that mission trips are not cheap. Average mission trip that you will take, this is average, going to cost you $2,000. Now, everybody that's got $2,000 right now, they want to lay down, rise to your feet, and come to the front. Didn't think so. What if you were able to take a mission trip once every three years for the rest of your life? Anyone can go if they're willing to invest in a mission savings plan. A personal savings account. You have a safety deposit box called a mason jar. And what you decide that you're going to do is, is that instead of stopping every morning by McDonald's to get one of those magape, frappe, mape, wapes with foam and, and whip topping and uh, caramel and chocolate and sprinkles, and 14,000 calories. 
Instead, what you do is you give up one of those every day. And if you will do that in three years, saving $2 a day, you will have $2,000. So you just skip one of those each morning. You take that money, you put it in the mason jar, and three years from now, you can go on a mission trip. won't cost you anything. That's good news. But you say, I don't want to wait three years. Well, if you save $3 a day, which really is more the cost of that Magape thing, if you, if you save $3 a day, you can take a mission trip every other year for the rest of your life. Imagine. Two years from right now, 2016, I'm on my first mission trip and I don't have to come back home worrying about what's on the credit card. I don't have to come back home worrying about how I'm going to pay for this. It's paid for. When you get on the airplane, you're able, to, you're able to fly away and you're able to go on this mission trip paid for in 2016. You come back home, $3 a day. And in 2018, you're on another trip. And you come home in $3 a day. And in 2020, you're on another one and another one and another one and another one. It's an investment, but you can do it. Encourage the church or your association to develop scholarship plans. I don't know what the budget of this church is. It's not my business. But if you really want to do missions, there ought to be a mission line item. And part of that mission line item ought to be that you're scholarshipping first-time people to go. You're deciding that you're going to make an investment in individuals to take their first mission trip. It can be as little as 10%. We're going to give you the first $200 towards your mission trip. I'm just saying 10%. If you want to tithe into missions, that'd be a good place to start. Amen? Elmdale said, the rest of Elmdale said, all of Elmdale said, <laughs> oh well, you'll do it if the Lord tells you to. Create endowments. Decide that when you die, you're going to leave something behind for the work of the Lord to continue. Decide right now that you're going to put something in your will and your trust. You're going to write it down and you're going to say, when I die, X number of dollars is going to go to Elmdale Baptist Church to set up a mission fund in my family's name. And for as long as it lasts, it's going to help young people make mission trips. And finally, A, we do this all to advance the kingdom. We're not doing it for personal gain. We're not doing it for personal recognition. We do it to advance the kingdom. Last year, over 15,000 short-term volunteers traveled on overseas mission trips. That's just in the Southern Baptist Convention. You need to join that army. Remember that you are uniquely gifted to serve Christ. When Christ saved you, He gifted you. Are you burying those gifts or are you using them for the kingdom? Be rigidly flexible. I know that's an oxymoron, but it's on purpose. Every mission team I lead, they know from the get-go, it's not going to go like we planned. You have to be rigidly flexible. Be a leader or appoint someone to be the leader. Be safe. Probably not a good idea to go down into Mexico right now, for example. Be safe. Be a promoter of the next mission adventure you, your church, your association will endeavor to undertake. Don't, don't pour cold water on this. You be a promoter. In doing so, you will advance the kingdom. And don't wait. That picture right there was shot off a hillside looking down into one of the villages in, in Bosnia. You see... One, two mosques right there with their spires. And we went door to door through these homes. Not in this village, but somewhere over there. A lady's holding a little green vinyl Bible that says Sveto Pismo. It's in her heart language. It's in Bosniak. And it tells her that Jesus loved her and sent his only begotten son. 
that whoever would believe would be saved and have eternal life. That's the message. That's the hope that the world is waiting to hear. You see, it is a dark world, but you can be a light in it. Every head bowed, every eyes closed.